thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that we are gathering on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Uh, here to discuss the changes to off-campus work hours for international students coming into effect in the coming months uh, and, and highlight how we're working with our partners, including provinces and territories and learning institutions to improve the integrity of the international student program and put in place rules that, to make sure that students are properly supported and successful here in Canada. In October of 2022, we waived the 20 hour per week limit for off-campus work for international students. At the time we were recovering from the pandemic, employers couldn't find workers for positions and many students were struggling with rising costs. Lifting this uh, threshold was uh, important to help local economies and small businesses as well as international students alike. In December, I announced the extension of that policy allowing for unlimited off-campus working hours for international students. At the time, I didn't want to make the changes in the middle of the study year and put some students in difficult financial positions. However, the policy expires today and it won't be renewed, uh, as it was a successful measure in helping our economy recovery from the pandemic and is therefore no longer necessary. The changes I'm about to announce won't affect most students who are just at the end of their academic year now and planning to work through the summer because students are already allowed to work unlimited hours during the school breaks under certain conditions um, stated in their study permits. At the same time, it's been shown by research and we know that increasing working hours while studying at post-secondary institutions can lead to declining academic performance and increase the risk that students will drop out of the programs. We need to support international students and make sure they are set up for success um, and that they're here properly studying. Looking at best practices and policies in other like-minded countries, most of them limit the number of working hours for international students. Canada's rules need to be aligned or we will find our programs attracting more and more applicants whose primary intent is to work and not study. We'll also, we also want to follow the research uh, and continue to improve the integrity of the entire international student program. To be clear, the, purposes, the purpose of the international student is to program is to study and, and not to work. So with these considerations in mind, we intend to make permanent changes to allow up to 24 hours of off-campus work for international students with a goal of having that in place for the fall. As most shifts are eight hours long, the new 24 hour rule means that students can work up to three shifts a week. Uh, to conclude, as I announced this past December, we increased financial requirements for new study permit applicants to a little over $20,000 for 2024. This figure is a more accurate reflection of the cost of living today in Canada and doubles what was required before. It means the students are better prepared for when they arrive. Uh, going forward, the financial requirements will be tied to the low income cutoff published by StatsCan each year to ensure it continues to reflect the true cost of living in our country. Change is just one of our many planned reforms to the International Student Program, which includes the implementation of a new recognized institutions framework that will reward post-secondary institutions that provide a higher standard of support for international students. We want to thank provincial and territorial partners for their ongoing work to help improve this program because we know a lot of that responsibility uh, and jurisdiction, frankly, lies on their shoulders. As well, I'll be meeting with provincial and territorial ministers on May 10th to discuss our plan for a sustainable, trusted immigration system and how to better align our immigration levels with the needs that have been expressed across the country. Uh, you previously floated the idea of 30 hours. Can you talk about how you got to 24? Yeah, look, it, eight shifts is uh, three shifts of eight hours. It seems reasonable. It's a lot to be working during the week. We know that over 20 uh, hours there were, there, there were more than 80 plus percent of students working over 20 hours. Uh, we think it would have been unduly burdensome to reduce it to 20 hours or even more. We know from studies as well that when you start working in and around the 30 hour levels, there is a material impact on the quality of your studies. And again, uh, being able to work 30, weeks, 30 hours a week is, is, is as close to a full time job and it doesn't make sense does not match with the idea behind the international student program, which is to which is to study and not to work. But again, it costs a lot of money to be an international student. It can cost forty thousand. So um, we don't want to put them in undue hardship. Students that want to come here have to realize that they can only work twenty four hours uh, in order to offset some of their costs or bring the uh, material resources themselves when they come. Why is it in the fall? Uh, it's just the implementation program. There is a consultation period that by law we have to undertake. Uh, Cancelling the policy right now means things snap back to 20 hours. Now, if you're a student 
and you're on you're on break like mo like like most students you can work uh, f you can work 40 hours a week or more but those that are taking full-time studies during the summer will in fact have to comply to a 20-hour week and that'll be ramped up after the consultation and regulation period to 24 hours in September so the, 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 the right to protest and the right to free speech is excessively important particularly in an academic setting setting McGill is a, a place of free discourse it's one where the right to protest has to be respected. Uh, it doesn't at the same time that right allow violence or permit or sanction violence. I think we have to be very careful about any sort of display of violence, intimidation towards students, um, nor does that type of protesting ever or ever should include hate speech, including any cinematic speech. So, it's something we have to watch very carefully as a society. Uh, McGill has an international reputation, um, and I think we have, it becomes a beacon for people to come and manifest their views. Um, and it's something I think as political actors we have to respect, but that again, we shouldn't tolerate for a second any form of violence or any hate speech, including anti Semitism. There is some question of whether or not the encampment will remain. Are you saying that you have not seen anything that crosses the line at this point? I have seen the press releases that have come from McGill. Uh, some of the acts alleged, if they are true, are extremely concerning. But I think as politicians looking at that setting, looking at what McGill represents, what academia represents, what that space represents for people, um, in the context of the war in Gaza is something I think we have to be very judicious in how we treat that. At the same time, we have to be quite categorical if we see any violence or intimidation of students, particularly to preserve that academic environment of freedom of expression and not tolerate for a second hate speech, including anti-Semitism. Mr. 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 On the Honda uh, yeah, sure. battery uh, f uh, factory, do you have any idea yet how many foreign workers are going to be coming to work on that? It's obviously a very a big concern to the building uh, unions. We've seen it in the, uh, with the Stellantis plants and, and Volkswagen I don't, as well. I don't, Glenn. I, I know that as part of the investment, the investors expect to be able to bring in workers, whether they are specialized or otherwise, uh, under the free trade agreements that we have and that we benefit from just as we send workers over to them. Uh, that reciprocity is, is integral to the actual investment. If people don't want the investment, um, that's their choice as well. We got that investment, we've made some commitments, didn't negotiate it myself, uh, but the reality is that we do have to ha have a number of workers that'll be in there, but at the same time guaranteeing good paying union jobs, and that's the, that's the assurances I understand we've gotten. But are those numbers codified in the agreements? Mm -hmm. I don't have that information for you. Yeah, I don't have that information for you. Since the Mexican visa requirements have come into place, have you seen a decrease in the number of asylum seekers writ large since those new rules have come in? We have certainly seen a, a drop, Mackenzie, in the number of claimants coming from Mexico. Uh, it is clear, and I think I made it clear during my press conference, that that was only a portion of the challenge that we're facing as a country, just like countries like us are facing in terms of asylum seekers. Um, I had announced at that time that I would be looking at other measures to put into place, which we will be looking at over the course of the next few months. The Mexican visa, as difficult a decision it was, including putting it into place from a logistical perspective, relatively easier compared to other countries in that top 20 because those countries already have visas that are required for people to get in. So we're taking a look at that. Uh, I think because it created some turbulence in the system, I wouldn't necessarily rely on the the, the March numbers, but perhaps look at April and May and then we'll be able to probably draw better conclusions at that point.